What we want to see is what I've called a property-owning democracy. We want to help people own their housing. The goal of a property-owning democracy. The right for every family to have their own home. To increase home ownership by one million. A whole generation given the security of a home of their own. Reigniting home ownership in Britain once again. Giving millions of young people the chance to own their own homes. House prices have reached another all-time high. You'd hear a lot about people investing and saying, oh, that's just my pension. For someone who was trying to get on the property ladder, um, it made me quite angry. You had become a bit of a plaything in financial markets. Developers saw their profits soar and their share prices rocket. Investors and developers have got far too greedy. They've made far too much money out of people's homes. When I revert back to 2006, the idea you got to buy a home, push your finances to the extreme to buy a home, renting is a dirty word. I do look back with real anger. It's entirely the government's fault. Governments in this country failed to build enough homes. The thing that makes me angry is that it is a political choice. Nothing needed to have happened, nothing should have happened, that allowed this market to get to this state. accepted Her Majesty the Queen's kind offer to form a new administration of government in this country. Outside the Treasury, the arrival of Gordon Brown prompted the unusual sight of a Chancellor being cheered in the street. Tuesday, uh, the 6th of May, first working day after the election, and on that Monday, I had come back from playing tennis and I got a phone call from Eddie George, the governor at the time. He said, come into the bank immediately. He told me that he had just been informed by Gordon Brown that the bank would be given operational independence to set interest rates. I have therefore decided to give the Bank of England operational responsibility for setting interest rates with immediate effect. The new Chancellor, Gordon Brown, took the city and Westminster by surprise this morning with his decision to radically alter the role of the Bank of England. The decision to make the Bank of England independent in 1997 was indeed arguably the most important decision that the new Labour government made in its 13 years in power. This was a watershed moment. The argument is, in the long term, mortgages should be cheaper and over a period of years make the cost of borrowing lower for everyone. Following the um, decision to make the Bank of England independent, and we saw a big fall in real interest rates then, a lot more people could suddenly afford to buy. When you have low interest rates, borrowing is really cheap. And if borrowing is really cheap, then the biggest form of debt that most people have, which is their mortgage, is really cheap, so people are able to buy houses. The problem, of course, though, is if everybody has a mortgage and everyone is buying a house, well then, you're going to have to pay more and more and more to get the houses. There's a bewildering array of loans about, with lenders cutting each other's throats to win business, offering ever lower rates on ever bigger sums. You have this explosion in mortgage credit, and this is a lot to do with the deregulation that we saw in the 1990s and in the 1980s but it's also to do with low interest rates. Because interest rates fell, which meant the cost of mortgages reduced, house prices were able to grow faster than wages grew. There's been another big rise in property prices. The boom has rippled out from London. They're on the up and up. House prices are soaring at their fastest rates since the boom of the 80s. Six 
10 million out of it. And so there was certainly a, a significant improvement in the confidence of the rest of the world in how the UK was being run, and that led more people to want to buy assets in the United Kingdom and meant that assets of all kinds in the United Kingdom became more expensive. There was a lot of money available looking for places to invest. Now, when you've got lots of money available to lend and when you've got uh, a supply of housing that is not as high as it should be, that's a lethal combination. I had a look at a flat and it was quite small, you know, modest kind of as you'd expect for a for a first time place. Um, it had sort of a, you know, one bedroom. Um, but as I was leaving, the estate agent kind of let slip. He said, oh, well, there's actually an investor who's put in an offer on the whole house. The traditional idea that most families could reasonably expect to own their own home, that actually was being overtaken uh, by a different kind of motivation, uh, that um, investing in property was better than investing in stocks and shares, um, in, in wealth creation. There was money coming in, and therefore you needed to create ways for that money to flow out. And clearly a substantial part of that was the buy-to-let market. It's quite simple. You buy a house, you let it out to tenants, they pay your rent, and this covers the mortgage. Tina buys houses like Imelda Marcos bought shoes. She currently owns not one, not two, not three, but 18 properties, and there's still no stopping her. And people were doing this, buying one, buying two, buying four. It was an arithmetic game. The TV programmes at the time really poured fuel on the fire and talked non-stop about the fact that you could be clever, you could buy a property, do it up, sell it for a lot more. I call them property porn because ultimately they were just, everyone was watching with these lustful eyes about what they could get and what they should do. Shafi has made some money in the property boom. She's just sold her flat in this tower block and invested the money in this £400,000 house in Hendon. Shaf is planning to put as many bedrooms as possible in this property so she can rent it out room by room for £3,500 a month. That's twice as much as she currently earns as a nurse. The process of rising prices created a surge of activity that reinforced the growth of uh, house prices and created this this spiral, this this period of exuberance. But while everyone knew that it couldn't last forever, no one was clear how and when it was going to stop. The number of people with mortgages fell, while the amount of those mortgages doubled in value. Credit was not going into creating more homeowners, it was just going into making homeowners need to borrow more money to purchase a house than they would have done previously. Property prices were rising all of the time, and that was always reported as a good news story. And that was really frustrating for someone who wanted to buy their first home. You would hear a lot about property investors, you'd hear a lot about buy to let, you'd hear a lot about people investing and, you know, people saying, oh, that's just my pension. And there seems to be the sense that people could just keep using property as an asset, as an investment, without there being a knock-on effect for people. And there 100% is a knock-on effect, especially when demand, you know, uh, was outstripping supply. That kind of felt like a real kick in the teeth. For someone who was trying to get on the property ladder, it made me quite angry. That's how I first got involved with Price Out. In London, I caught up with some young people demonstrating outside a property investment show. 
it's really widening the gap between rich and poor. People with property are the ones who are able to get more, and that's what inequality is. And people who don't have anything are, you know, completely disenfranchised. You know, I can't afford to get an ex-council flat in most places. So Price Out was formed in the early 2000s to kind of be the voice um, of the, the first time buyer who was struggling to get onto the property market. You know, we obviously felt strongly about um, the situation that we were facing. Central government had a role to really sit up and see the crisis that was unfurling before them, and 100% that was the opposite of what we, what we experienced. I think it's fair to say that back in 2003, housing was just beginning to rise up the political agenda and everyone was obsessed with this question of why house prices seemed to be exploding, um, but you know, supply wasn't responding to keep up. And so you had this kind of powder keg that was really pushing prices up quite quickly. Prices were rising really quickly, but the supply of new housing wasn't. And you hadn't got enough housing. So what was exercising the Treasury, if you like, was this problem. So the Treasury rang me up and said, would I like to lead a review on housing? Kate Barker is a top economist, asked by the Treasury to look at what's needed to take the heat out of the housing market. The Treasury asked me to. They asked us to estimate how many homes we had to be building to reduce that long-term trend in house prices rising relative to incomes. So. We had a pretty heroic go at it. The report by Ms Kate Barker today concludes that the supply of new homes consistently lags behind demand and that the number of houses built in Britain, which are currently 175,000 a year, must rise substantially if we are to reduce house price inflation. The ballpark range of new private housing that we were talking about was probably around the 240 to 250,000 range. The Barker Review completely defined the way that we all thought about housing. I think why it was so groundbreaking was it was the most forensic diagnosis of the problem. It escalated it uh, to the point that we started to understand that there was a genuine crisis and it talked about the need to build more homes. And that in the end, there was this massive mismatch between the demand for housing and the supply of homes. And until you tackled that, you wouldn't be able to break out of the housing crisis. And I think that completely changed the game. She also talked rightly about people's well-being, if you like, the social impact of there being adequate housing. The way in which the housing stock was allocated just wasn't fair. So we had this shortage of social housing at the, at the bottom, so that only very poor people were being housed. The people in the level just above that sort of struggling to get into good private rent. And then very difficult for people to move into owner occupation. She also pointed out the, the intimate link between the availability of housing and the performance of the economy. More and more money is tied up in mortgages to buy houses as the prices escalate, the mortgages go up, so they've got less money to spend or to save. Uh, and that is, you know, a serious problem for the wider economy. The whole bias of the lending system shifted against creative, productive activity and in favour of property. It sucks too much investment into housing as opposed to into small firms and industry in other ways. For England, we will raise the annual house building target for 2016 from 200,000 houses a year to 240,000 new homes a year. The housing stock did increase. In 2007, we built more houses than at any time since the height of the Thatcher era. But it was quite clear to all of us uh, that if we were going to start to deal with the uh, problems being caused by the lack of housing, we needed to build much, much more. I often look back at this with a bit of a shudder. They really geared up to deliver more houses. If you look back at 2007 to 8, real evidence of greater delivery. And then, of course, the financial crisis came. 
It's official, property prices are rising fast. There's more evidence today that house prices are continuing to rise rapidly. The economy seemed to be booming. A lot of people thought that we were in, you know, wonderful period of everlasting expansion. But a lot of it hinged on the boom in the housing market. It was a time when, if a bank glanced at you out of the corner of their eye, before you knew it, they would have given you a mortgage for £200,000. I mean, they were just spitting them out there with ease. Often 100% mortgages, 125% mortgages. And it was all based on this idea that you couldn't lose with property. House prices are continuing to rise strongly. Not only have house prices gone up again, but it's the biggest monthly rise for almost two years. They were being pushed up further by credit being pumped into the market by the banks and building societies. They appeared to be no limit on what they were willing to put into the market. For me, the total ambition is to make buying houses as easy as buying a carton of milk out of Tesco. It's about 15 times my annual income, I believe. Um, that just makes it completely unaffordable for me to be able to live in and around where I work. I distinctly remember one conversation with a chief executive of a building society who appeared fixated over success being the ability to lend more. The regulations were not tight at the time. They were simply chucking out mortgages to anybody and everybody because it was making them money to do so without any real strong, tangible form of responsibility. People began to create a myth within themselves that this process was undeniably good, that everyone was gaining from it. And if we were creating it, well, why not have a share of it? People would be taken out, all expenses paid, golfing trips, restaurants where people would literally order the largest lobster that they could see. Here at the Building Society, they can't lend money fast enough. The explosion of activity, all the bad things that happened in the noughties, even now I burn with anger at the greed, the selfishness, the short-termism. It was only a matter of time before something stopped the party. I and I think some others were warning that, that we had something like a bubble in the housing market, which was a dangerous state of affairs. When I revert back to 2006, 2007, to the idea you've got to buy a home, push your finances to the extreme to buy a home, renting is a dirty word, I do look back with real anger. Fears are growing that many people could be taking on too much debt. Appetite for borrowing is stronger than ever. The Bank of England said mortgage lending rose by a record £8 billion last month. The Bank of England, I think, needs to accept some responsibility. They knew what was happening. They were tracking flows of credit into the housing market. They publish statistics on this every month. So, yes, uh, they were, uh, to some extent, I think, asleep at the wheel. There are signs of trouble in the broader mortgage market. Foreclosures hit a record last quarter. There were a lot of mortgages that were lent out to people. They may not have had jobs, they may not have had any form of income whatsoever. Nevertheless, lenders said, well, interest rates are low, we can still make money off these people. So the house isn't a financial product but the mortgage that you've taken out to buy it did become a financial product, which was bought and sold. You had become a bit of a plaything in financial markets. Right through the first half of 2007, those of us in the Bank of England were worried about the signs that we were seeing about excessive borrowing. Good evening. Thousands of customers have been queuing up outside branches of the troubled mortgage lender Northern Rock to withdraw their money. There were lines in Nottingham, Hull and London. Nobody's given an absolute guarantee that the money is safe in this bank. I don't think we could have anticipated precisely the timing and the nature of the events that would have prevented it from occurring. 
but warnings we certainly wanted to give, and we did. Shares have plummeted around the world, billions wiped off their value. Central banks, among them the Bank of England, are pouring funds into financial markets. Mortgages are in short supply, and more and more people are falling behind with their payments, added to which every single day seems to bring a new piece of bad news from America. We wanted to put in place a number of measures to make sure the economy did not stall or worse, go into depression. But also, uh, we wanted to make sure that people weren't fearful of losing their own homes or facing unemployment, which is why we put in place a number of measures, including measures to support the housing market. Governments gain popularity by pushing home ownership and see it, and have done for a long time, as the holy grail. Now, the problem with that is when home ownership slows, it's because the markets are slowing. There was an absolute fear of house prices falling and the loss, the flow through of the impact that has on our banking sector, given the size of mortgage debt, of the impact that has on economic activity. I'm off to Sussex to meet a couple who can't afford their new mortgage, and selling would mean losing money because of the collapse in house prices. They're desperate. I feel a bit of my fingers have been burnt for something I haven't done, you know, I've just been happily paying my mortgage and all of a sudden we're in this situation and it's quite harsh to take. What we had in 2009 was a very unusual situation. The amount of money was going down. And we didn't want that to continue because that might have led to a repetition of the Great Depression in the 1930s. So we printed, using quantitative easing, more money in order to ensure that the amount of money in the economy in total was growing. It was an initially an experiment. Um, I think people didn't fully understand what it was going to achieve. I think we, many of us agreed it was necessary to try it. It's a very simple idea, which is quantitative easing increases the amount of money in the economy, and that will increase asset prices, and in turn, will ultimately lead to more spending. If it runs on, the risk is you start inflating asset prices, highest prices. And that's something that's not good for the economy as a whole. And, you know, I think at that time, we thought, well, this will all get wound up. £300,000 could buy you a flat or a house at a push, but not in Belgravia. £300,000 is how much the average property in the area went up by last year. The size of new mortgages could be limited to just three times your salary, and borrowers could be told they need bigger savings to get a home loan. It's going to take us forever to be able to get a house, and the only other option would be to rent. I moved to London from Leeds in 2010, and I was really shocked by how high rents were. There was this sort of idea after the the financial crash that housing was more affordable, but that never found its way uh, to private renters. It, ne it never found its way to people on lower or middle incomes. I think the people that, you know, really benefited were people who had the money to come in and, like, buy up the now cheaper houses, which ordinary folks couldn't afford still. The average first-time buyer will have to wait until they're in their 50s before they can even afford a deposit. The one there on the right. What about young professionals who can't access social housing? We can't rent because the rents are too high and we can't get on the property ladder. Social housing was being squeezed, home ownership was being squeezed, and, and more and more people were being housed in the private rented sector. The group that didn't benefit, which normally would have done, would have been those that are waiting to buy. The cycle of house prices falling, so people selling homes, so homes go on the market, so there's an excess supply of homes, so house prices fall, etc. That process did not happen. 
the crash did bring a slight decrease in prices, but that still wasn't enough. And that's because the underlying issues didn't change. The makeup of the housing market, if you like, stayed the same. There still wasn't enough supply. There still wasn't a level playing field. I am married. My husband is an accountant and we have two children. We work really hard and between us have a good joint wage. Yet still, we cannot afford our own family home. Well, Anna, this is one of the things that I, along with immigration actually, that I probably hear about more than anything else as I travel around the country. The house building industry has really not served us well in this country. We've also got to build more houses. I think there's no doubt uh, in my mind that we've got to change the planning system right now. 11 hours, 40 minutes after the polling stations closed, it is a hung parliament. Mathematically, no party can now get an overall majority, and so there will have to be negotiations over what happens now about who becomes our next Prime Minister. Earlier today, standing by the front door of number 10, Prime Minister David Cameron and his deputy Nick Clegg shook hands. Mr Cameron said they were ushering in a new era in which the national interest came before party politics. It's not just about the economy, it's also about um, people's hopes and dreams. We will provide hundreds of thousands of new homes for families to live in, and that's what today is all about. David believed that extending home ownership, the idea of a property-owning democracy, the idea of spreading ownership more widely, was good for society overall. I was uh, heading up the city's policy unit. If you think about the work that had been put in from the Barker Review, which had very much taken us to housing supply, and the coalition government came in and said, we've got to get the market working better. The answer to that is planning. So a huge set of planning reforms in order to essentially give developers maximum ability and right to build and build at scale. I was given a task to produce a national planning policy framework for the first time. I wondered what the best way to approach that uh, was. Miata van Buller was the, the brilliant uh, official uh, who was uh, in the cabinet office. We were trying to essentially completely revise the national planning policy framework. Now, this was a framework that ran into the thousands of pages um, that the government was trying to do a massive overhaul of to make it simpler, uh, to make it more digestible, but also to make it work in the interest of those that build. The key provision was that there was what we called a presumption in favour of sustainable development. The response, I, I think, did take us all by surprise. This country is crawling with hysterical, nihilistic people. According to the coalition government, they include the members of the National Trust, Friends of the Earth, the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds and the Bat Conservation Trust. These deranged organisations, that seems to be the judgement of ministers, are furious at plans by the government to allow concrete to be laid in the countryside. It's the most biased document I've ever seen. But it's simply, not a planning document, it's a lobbying document. This is simply not true. If you read the document in detail, you will see that the protections that it we've detail. enjoyed... For, well, I invite your, your, your viewers to, I'm, to look I'm, at it in detail. I'm, 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 I'm not a nihilistic, nihilistic left-winger. I remember the response vividly, uh, because I think when the National Trust mobilises, um, it sends terror through Whitehall, and it certainly sends terror through uh, Conservative MPs. I think we underestimated the extent to which the, the radicalism of the, the, the document would spook people. Yeah, hello. Hi. Can I say hello? I'm Sadie Javid. Hi. Hello. 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 What's your yeah. policy on housing? Yeah, what, uh, in general? Conservative policy on housing. As a constituency MP, housing was, was clearly a big issue. I would receive in my mailbag, in my surgeries, was a um, being contacted by people uh, that were almost always against new housing. The central problem is we have too many people that don't want new housing in their backyard, in their neighbourhood, 
because uh, they, they feel it will affect their house price or that you know, it's going to spoil their view and that is what motivates them more than thinking about the next generation. The only way you make a real difference to the housing stock is by building on Greenbelt land. Done. The answer from the neighbours is not on my doorstep. Would you like to see Greenbelt land built on? Uh, not on my doorstep. <laughs> I was giving a speech and I was sort of summoned out for a call with the Prime Minister. He wanted to appoint me Planning Minister. I turned up at the department. Uh, Eric Pickles, who didn't know me particularly well uh, and I think probably didn't have a huge amount of uh, sympathy for me, uh, viewed me with intense suspicion uh, as some narc who'd been sent in by the Chancellor to mark his homework. I love Nick very much. I didn't ask for him, um, and um, I think he found it very difficult. Idealism came up against the sheer practicalities of, um, of, uh, the, of the nature of politics. I took the view that I didn't have very long to get stuff done. We had two points we were trying to get across. The first point was not very much of England is built on, even though it doesn't always feel like that when you're driving down suburban roads. Uh, and then the second point we were trying to get across was that new housing developments can be great. My husband and I work as carers in the community and we still can't reach, you know, like getting a deposit together for the mortgage, paying the monthly rent with four children. Your situation is, is absolutely typical, I'm afraid, and it's, I mean, it's a huge national crisis. I think, uh, for my money, I think it's the biggest social justice crisis we have. Building on a few meadows outside Harlow is not going to cure the housing crisis. Um, th there are plenty of empty buildings, there's plenty of sites with planning permission existing which haven't been used yet. You know, home ownership sank by five percentage points in the last decade in England. The we problem with housing in this country is... Simon, again, how many homes do you own? This is how many homes do you own? I'm paying for your houses. <laughs> Bloody hell. Now, fortunately, I had decided quite early on that the only way this was going to work was if I was willing to take an unlimited amount of heat. I remember the headline of the, the front page splash of the Daily Telegraph, Minister's War on the Countryside. It was exhausting. I mean, it was really, really <laughs> exhausting. Um, but hey, you know, I was, I was young and, and ambitious. Well, it's a great thinker, is Nick but he decided to announce um, a massive house building programme the weekend of the Conservative Councillor's um, annual conference. So I spent quite a bit of my morning on the Saturday talking to him um, uh, on the telephone to see exactly what he was doing. I think that the difficulty that the Conservative Party has is that it weighs up against each other. On the one hand, the people that they know vote for them, who live in agreeable houses with views of green fields, and who might be members of the local Conservative Association, and then a theoretical group of people who are in their 20s and 30s. They have no idea how they vote. They rather suspect that they probably don't vote Conservative. I have reached a conclusion, which is that the Conservative Party is never going to do what is necessary to meet the housing needs of the British people. And it will never put sufficient weight on the interests of those who currently do not have a place to live. you have the conversation with developers and that what they will tell you is, why would we build, why would we flood the market with housing? It doesn't work for our business model because in the end, that model relies on the fact that demand outstrips supply and therefore prices are always increasing and you can generate a return. The business model of the house building sector has always been to drip feed new supply. You don't want to move into increasing uh, supply uh, and flooding the market. 
We noticed in Taylor Wimpy's 2011 report a line that would easily be skimmed over but is really significant, um, and that is that their strategy was to prioritise margin over volume. And what that essentially means is that you grow the, the, the sale price, you grow the margin of profit on each home rather than commensurately building more housing. You're making your money through price increases rather than increased output. And that's really significant, that really, uh, really revealed the, the strategy. So what that equates to is that you can increase profitability by increasing the amount that you charge and the profit you can make on each home rather than simply increasing profit by building a lot more. Developers absolutely reduce the number of homes that they build out in order to keep prices and profits at a level that they believe is necessary in order to ensure that they get an appropriate return on investment. Coming out of the financial crisis, we were pretty keen to match our volume with a combination of market demand and land availability and planning availability. You know, the key thing for making a difference to the housing crisis is about number of houses built, but it's number of houses built over 10 years, over 20 years, over 30 years, not the number of houses built before the next general election. Hello, good evening. Flat, stagnant and sluggish. Now, that's just what the optimists are saying. The rest are warning the economy faces a triple-dip recession, the first the country has seen in modern times. The latest figures show the country's economy shrank by 0.3%, numbers that will increase the pressure on George Osborne to come up with a plan B and bluntly to make it grow again. We were in a situation then where first-time buyers were effectively being shut out because they didn't have the 20% deposit uh, that would be needed to be able to get a mortgage to buy a property. I had many conversations with people in the industry uh, as well as with other politicians and certainly the, the big housing developers always made the case that uh, we would get more houses built if the housing market was booming um, and if demand was strong and that's why they favoured what were effectively sub mortgage subsidies to keep up demand. In March 2013, the day before the budget, I got a call from our trade body to say, uh, Andrew, you know, just to be aware, what you're going to see tomorrow is a new scheme on steroids. Today I can announce help to buy. It's a great deal for home buyers. It's a great support to home builders. A deposit of just 5% is needed for a new build of up to £600,000. The government lends the purchaser a 20% equity loan, meaning they just need to secure a 75% mortgage. And from January, Help to Buy will be offering a mortgage guarantee scheme. It's this part of the scheme which will provide £130 billion worth of mortgages. really wanted to go, get out, get our own place, um, own our own property, um, so we've been saving and if obviously we'd had to save up for the 10% it would have took us longer. We didn't want to have to spend every less penny we earned on an house what we couldn't really afford to pay 10% on. That scheme, which I used myself, encouraged people not only to take on mortgages, but help to buy loans from the government, which when you start repaying them, as I just have, are not cheap to repay, and the interest rates are inflation-linked. I've since actually interviewed one of George Osborne's advisors who worked on the help to buy scheme, and I told him that I used it, and he was like, oh, but surely you've paid off your loan. And I was like, no. If I had £200,000 in the bank, do you think I would have taken a government loan? It's a huge amount of money. It's more money than most people will ever see in one go in their entire lives.
I think it's pretty clear that if you simply try to give people money to buy houses, then what you do is push up the prices. I made that clear both privately and publicly, and if the idea was to do, do something to deal with a very short-run problem, but it's only a short-run scheme, well, OK, but it cannot be seen as part of a long-run policy. There was a, an argument going on with government, I sort of had a public argument with the Treasury about this, about using techniques like help to buy, aggravating the problem, not solving it. Some of it is often cannibalising, it's self-defeating, often increasing the price of properties by more than the amount you help people get on the housing ladder in the first place. They've been helped to buy a house that's more expensive than it would have been had they not had the inflationary effect. It's really helped the people already own their homes because they've had a little boost to their, to their capital value of their home. You know, George Osborne was always motivated by the politics as well as uh, the fundamental issue. So yes, he saw that a, a little housing boom uh, would be good for the economy, it would be good for people's sense of well-being, and it would be good for the chances of the Conservative Party uh, at the next election. I've no doubt that um, the Help to Buy scheme did have some incidental benefits. I'm, I'm sure a few more houses were built and a few more people did get on the housing ladder, but its main impact was in pushing up the price of housing, kicking away the ladder that middle-income families were climbing to get into the housing market and enriching directors and uh, executives of, of the big property developers. Bovis has reported a steep rise in pre-tax profit. Here's another upbeat set of figures from the housing industry. The UK's main house builders saw big profits this week. Big rises in profits at all the big builders. Some say it could be down to the government's help to buy scheme. You might remember that allows me. Profit is kind of bursting into kind of new territory, if you like, to historically unprecedented levels. So prior to the, the, the financial crisis, house builders were generating around £2 billion of profit before tax a year. What we saw was by 2015, profit before tax for the big house builders was around three and a half billion. I think the problem with Help to Buy is that it was continued for too long. It was the right intervention to make to kickstart a recovery in house building, coming out of the deep financial crash and then a pretty deep recession. But what happened, and that's why people called it cocaine for house builders, is that the house builders became hooked on it. They are large asset managers, pension funds from other countries, and interestingly, they have shareholdings in multiple house building firms, some of them in almost all. When we started to look at dividends, piecing together the bits of information for each house builder. The scale of increase in dividends over this time is so extraordinary. We've maybe got this wrong, and so we went back just, to, just as a check that we, we were correct, which we were. Before the financial crisis, what we saw was dividend payments collectively among the big house builders was in the three to 400 million range. So by 2015, it was a billion pounds. By 2017, it was 1.8 billion pounds. And by 2019, our estimates are that it was around 2.5 billion pounds. Now, to put that into context, that equates to the sum that was being spent around that time by our major government affordable house building program equated to just the dividends that those eight companies could, could pay out. If your aim is to maximise shareholder value, then you look for the prime sites and you look for the houses which are going to accrue the better returns, which might be the more expensive end of the spectrum. The impact of this on new home buyers is buyers are going to have to buy for over and above what they would have done pre-crash. Pre 
Rachel in Manchester has been saving for 10 years, but says prices are racing away from her. Property prices are really inflated compared to what you actually earn. On a normal salary, I'm not sure how I'm expected to be able to get a mortgage. The property boom is now rippling far beyond London. It's just impossible, to be honest, to be able to get on the housing ladder. Of the most unaffordable places to live in the UK, around half are in the countryside. We would hear about people from the Midlands, from the West Country, from, from Scotland, from all over really. We would hear about people who were really struggling, you know, couldn't afford their own home and, and felt powerless and, and felt really cross about the state of things. The International Monetary Fund has warned that ever-increasing house prices could threaten the recovery. Every year, the IMF, doctors the world economy, pops in for a home visit to check all's well. This year, there were warnings that the housing market presented a potential threat. Keeping interest rates low could further fuel house prices and increase risks to financial stability. Everybody has got used to super low interest rates. House prices are so many times more than people's earnings. What we've lived through is a complete, unprecedented anomaly, 300-year historic lows. I think we were lulled into a completely false sense of security by thinking that interest rates could always stay low. I think that's a mistake. Let me spell it out. Does the housing market pose an immediate threat to financial stability today? No, it doesn't. Could it in the future? Yes, it could. This low interest rate regime is inflating house prices. And rather than pushing back on this cycle, governments have done the opposite. They've said, oh, there's a problem with the market and not enough people can, can get on the housing ladder. The growing demand for housing has to be met by growing supply. The alternative, as in any market, is that prices will rise so that homes become unaffordable to many of our citizens and take up ever more of their incomes. Local authorities in England can compel developers to build some affordable housing. Now, affordable means that they're within the reach of local people on average salaries. You'll continue to see the development of great affordable housing for people in this city. Ready? In hereby preparing this wonderful, new, fantastic addition to London's growing quotient of affordable housing. Open. There you go. I was approached by Boris Johnson to become his chief of staff and also to take responsibility for the planning department. And so it was, it was one of those jobs when you're offered it, you take about 30 seconds to consider the pros and cons and say yes. His big concern was numbers. How do you get more housing? It wasn't just about affordable housing, council housing um, or anything else, it was all stock. We had a number of key regeneration areas, um, places like Battersea Nine Elms. It was the Nine Elms and Battersea Power Station development was the most physical example of like the massive changes that were taking place in the city. And you've got the state and the government, both at local and national levels and at City Hall, saying, what we're gonna do is this is going to be private-led, largely because councils were under this incredible financial pressure because of austerity. So we had to find new developers, new sources of money. So that was all about going out to all the different markets and saying London is open for business. It's a place designed to attract the global community. The question, though, is whether this type of urban regeneration benefits ordinary Londoners. A private developer business model is to try and maximise their profit. When you ask them to deliver affordable housing alongside on the site, 
they get planning permission on a certain amount of affordable homes. But then they can turn around and say, oh, I don't think I'm going to make profit anymore. So can I cut back on the affordable homes or can I get rid of them altogether? Uh, let's talk about Nine Elms uh, for a second, because uh, 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 I think it's a good example of the challenges that we were facing. You couldn't get there. I remember the early discussions. We talked to Network Rail. We started to think about extending the Northern Line. Now, the thing is, that was about a billion pounds to do that. And then we needed about a billion for the rest of the infrastructure that was needed. Now, when you've done that kind of sum, you haven't got a lot left for affordable housing. They're spending more than a billion pounds on restoring the power station itself. From Shanghai to Singapore, Battersea's just gone on sale around the world. A global marketing push launched by its Malaysian owners last month. I mean, people complain about the price of some of those properties. But I'm afraid if you're not going to sell a penthouse apartment for a few billion, a, a few million, sorry, you're not going to um, be able to afford to build some of the other affordable housing. Imagine what Nine Elms could have been, that land, if we'd have just, even just got the basics, think of all the good that could have happened. The heart's gone out of Battersea now. Very expensive, the property around here. People feeling squeezed out, and they are feeling squeezed out, out of their homes, out of their areas, and they don't see long-term future for their children growing up. Did you ever think, you could have got some more affordable housing out of them? Why didn't we do that? Well, you always ask those kind of questions. Did did did, did go hard enough? Um, that was always a judgment call. I'm sure we've got some of those a little bit wrong. I don't think overall we got it badly wrong. I think we got pretty much everything we wanted. The developers, they end up with all the power. It's weighted towards them. It's weighted towards their bottom line. Um, and that's what we saw historically. We saw time and time again during this period, affordable housing numbers reduced. Future generations in England face rising private rents and increased poverty unless more affordable housing is built. That's the warning by the charity. And in 2013, 2014, Oxford didn't build a single affordable dwelling. Where are the affordable houses you're talking about? Because they're definitely not in Brighton. They're probably not in the southeast. I'm going to be in rented accommodation for the rest of my life because I'll never be able to afford a house. business model of private sector developers is simply not set up to build lots of affordable homes. But both the Conservative Party and the Labour government under Tony Blair and Gordon Brown just didn't believe that the public sector could or should uh, be given sufficient funds to go on a major house building programme. I went to this event with people who were like organising on housing estates right across Europe and I was so shocked to hear them talk about, you know, rampant gentrification, eviction, high rents, displacement of, of working class communities. It was a real eye opener for me to understand that this wasn't just about a conservative government who were kind of pursuing these policies, it was much bigger than this.
marching through streets that many can't afford to live on. They called for more affordable and council properties. Social housing is a right! Here to stay! Here to fight! The government knows it faces trench warfare over housing. Somebody said to me centuries ago there were bread riots. When are there going to be housing riots? It's time that you put a cap on private rent in. You don't allow foreign investors to come in and buy up all the properties. As the chief steward, I was under pressure. There was anger on the March for Homes, and that was good, and that was powerful. The level of public support for what we were doing was just huge because people were living it. And if they weren't living it, then their kids were living it, or their grandkids were living it. This private landlords are ripping us off. Something needs to be done about it. It's social cleansing at its very worst. We aren't just passive here. We're going to fight back. People suffer in silence around housing, but the March Homes has brought people together. I've just had an audience with Her Majesty the Queen following the dissolution of Parliament. The general election will be held on May the 7th. What struck me going into the 2015 election as a person that was uh, leading off work on housing policy was we had a new generation of young renters uh, who weren't going to play by the old rules of the game. There was a big shift in the debate. I made the case often that the Conservative Party is ultimately doomed if young people can't get a place to live and develop a life uh, like their parents did. When there's an election, politicians always like to talk about housing and promise that they're going to magic up homes for people. But I think something else was going on. The housing crisis at that point was starting to get so bad that it could no longer be ignored. How about a Britain where a young couple don't have to dream of owning their own home, but can actually afford to do it? For so many people, the dream of home ownership is just disappearing into the distance. That's why we've got a better plan. The dream of a property-owning democracy is alive, and we will help you fulfil it. One of the most fiercely contested elections of recent times has ended with the Conservatives on course to win a majority. He's moving back in. David Cameron and his wife Samantha have arrived back in Downing Street knowing he has a second term as Prime Minister. The supply of social housing is shrinking. House prices are going up. Rents are going up. Building more homes is critical. Conditions were absolutely slum-like is the only way I can describe it. Tonight, a number of banks and lenders have stopped offering new mortgages. And suddenly, we were now at that ticking time bomb explosion period. What's different about the UK housing market that impacts where we build and how we rent our homes? To watch exclusive insights from government and housing market experts, go to bbc.co.uk slash Britain's housing crisis and follow the links to the Open University.